Well, this week there's been accusations of racism and stupidity around the Voice referendum, a leaked video of pro-yes campaigner and politician Professor Marsha Langton claimed that people who vote no are racist or just plain stupid. And we're joined by uh, David Robertson from the Ask Project today, who's going to be exploring what this reveals about the nature of this referendum and I guess the state of political debate in modern Australia as well. Good morning, David. Great to chat with you, mate. Yeah, uh, good to chat with you. It's uh, it's interesting as uh, I've lived in Australia for four years, but I guess I'm still a relative outsider. So it's just interesting to watch all this. Yeah. So what what are your observations, I guess, as, as you say, an outsider um, with, the, I mean, this instance in particular, but obviously the whole referendum uh, as a whole, um, there's been a, a bit of this sort of brewing, isn't it? Yeah, so it's very, very similar to the Brexit debate we had in the UK in 2016. And for a while, the, you know, basically on one side in the Brexit debate were all the major academics, most of the politicians, most of the media, actually, uh, all the big corporations. And if you lived in a, you know, a well-off area, a, a kind of upper middle class area, n- nobody would admit to being for Brexit. There, there were lots of people... I think, who voted for Brexit, who just kept it quiet. It was not the kind of thing you see at dinner parties. But one of the accusations that was made of people who vote for Brexit are a bit thick. They're a bit racist or stupid. So when I heard these remarks, I thought, oh, no, don't do that. That's such a big mistake. Because there were people on both sides who were thought about issues and disagreed. Uh, Once one side starts calling the other one just names, implying a kind of moral superiority, it creates enormous difficulties. And uh, I thought this particular incident was really bad because for two things. Number one, uh, I did listen to the video of what she said, and she did say that the uh, no campaign were basing their thing on racism and uh, and or stupidity. Now, the immediate pushback against that was people saying, oh, no, the Australian newspaper, they're lying. She didn't say that. Uh, uh, She she didn't call all no voters racist. But actually she did. If a campaign is being based upon racism and if you support that campaign, you either are racist yourself or you're too stupid to see that it was racist. And that's exactly what she was saying. Uh, Another interview she gave a while ago, she said that 20 percent hard no vote was racist. So it's deeply disturbing because you've got people like, you know, indigenous people like Jacinta Price who are against yeah. Uh, the voice. I'm, I'm thinking of uh, a couple of indigenous friends I've got who think it's it's pointless, it's useless. They're not racist because they oppose it, and they're not stupid either. Mm. You know, and I, I think Christians need to be very careful, especially that we do not get involved in that level of discourse. I know people who are very strongly for the voice who are Christians. I know people who are very strongly against it. Uh, neither of them are the less are, are the less Christian because of it. So I think there's a warning there about the divisiveness. Um, And it's ironic that the the voice is supposed to be about bringing Australia together. And I suspect it will be the most divisive thing that's occurred in Australia Mm. for a decade. Well, that's the danger, isn't it? I mean, even when we get to the end of this, and although the polls are looking like it's going to be more and more uh, one-sided, obviously we won't know that till the actual date comes. But that's the danger, isn't it? That it becomes divisive no matter what. Like, you know, whether the outcome... Uh, is for or against, uh, ultimately, the people that uh, you know, vote yes and it, if it's a no or vice versa, they're going to be upset. And so then that creates continual division even beyond the vote. Well, it does. And I think um, another problem there is that for a lot of people, political issues have now become religious issues. Mm. And uh, w- 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 again, what we noticed in the UK with Brexit, you had people who actually said, you know, I wouldn't let my daughter go out with someone who voted for Brexit or something. And you had, you had families divided. You had churches getting divided mm. on it. Now, a similar situation in Scotland was the Scottish independence referendum. Now, personally, I was for Scottish independence and I argued for it, but that wasn't the church position. The church did not take a position and they were quite right not to. And in my congregation, there were people of all political persuasions and I certainly would not bring politics into the pulpit and would not have the church making political statements because I'm acutely aware of the divisiveness of, of this. If you're asking, should we treat all people equally? Yes. If you're asking, 
should we oppose racism? Yes, of course. Mm. You know, but if you're asking, should we support a particular political position um, in, in trying to achieve those aims? Uh, as a church, I think the church needs to be really, really careful because we're not a political organization. Ultimately, reconciliation comes through Jesus Christ. And it's somewhat ironic if churches and Christians divide over a political issue when we're supposed to be bringing reconciliation. Yeah, that's right. That's the irony of it, isn't it? I mean, ultimately, that's yeah. the, the gospel message um, is where the, the church should be championing this, uh, yeah, the, the reconciliation message, as you say, both on a spiritual level and in a natural level. Uh, would be a perfect opportunity, but it's been a missed opportunity in many cases. Yes, I think it has, because I actually saw one uh, one leading evangelical writing saying this was the hope for peace in Australia, and I'm going, no, it's not. Mm. Uh, neither, neither the voice nor against the voice. You know, there are no political solutions. Politics is important, but there are no political solutions that bring peace. Mm. The only person who brings peace is Jesus Christ. And, you know, I, I, the needs of the indigenous community, in the same way as the needs of, needs of so many others, they're not going to be solved by politics. You know, and this, this, um, this obsession with... So, I, I mean, the thing I don't understand, and I genuinely don't understand this, on the one hand, we're constantly being, being assured that the voice isn't that important in that uh, it can't do anything, it will have no power, it's just an advisory group, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then on the other hand, we're being told, if this doesn't happen, you know, Australia is doomed, and, mm. you know, this, this, this will cause people to commit suicide. Or I'm just thinking, well, stop the exaggerated language, tell the truth, realize that if this is a good thing, and at one level I look at it and think, yeah, why, why not? Um, then it, it's it's very minimal. It's very minimal. It's not. Let's put it this way. I don't think that the voice is going to deal with poverty amongst um, indigenous communities, and I, and and, the, and there's different types of poverty as well. Of course, there's there's you know the poverty of of money and so on, but there's poverty in relationships, poverty in mm. so many other things. And ultimately, it is only the gospel that deals with that. And I think as Christians, that's where our emphasis should be. But we seem to just reflect the politics of the culture. Mm. I'll take a stab at this. I reckon that if if you're in a nice white middle class church in the eastern suburbs, you're pretty well going to be voting for uh, the Voice, and and even possibly have a yes post. I mean, all the yes posters. I live in the in a nice area, you know, the north in the North Shore and any posters I've seen have been yes. Nobody would dare put up a no poster here. Mm. But but I reckon if you went to uh, working class communities and others, it would be a little bit different. You know, and I think churches, far too often, we just tend to reflect the culture and the views of the culture around us. And we, we, need, we need to be different. You know, and at the very least, we need to be able to have a respectful discussion. So I've seen... Christians, I've seen this happen. You know, I've seen people like, uh, you know, Stephen Shaura, who's uh, opposed to The Voice, and then and John Anderson, who are both very, very respectful people, and they're both opposed. And then there are others like Kanishka Raphael, the Archbishop of Anglican Archbishop of Sydney. He's for it, you know, and they speak well and graciously, and they don't um, of one another, and they don't. Inv- Involve the kind of, I think, race baiting that Marcia Langton did. Mm, yeah, that's right. I guess even like I know the PM uh, Albanese, he said uh, a yes vote will show that Australia has matured. So even though that's not saying well you're stupid, but does it does it sort of imply that if you vote no that you're you haven't matured? Do you know what I mean? Like there even is a bit of a subtle uh, nuance in that, isn't there? Well, yeah, and also there's a kind of virtue signaling and the whole ethics identity thing. So the idea is I'm going to vote yes because I care for Aboriginal people, which means that if you don't vote yes, you don't care. Mm. And I'm, I'm afraid that's the kind of politics that, you know, a lot of our young people are being fed. If you care for LGBTQ people, whatever, then you will support same-sex marriage. Well, actually, you might not support same-sex marriage precisely because you do care. Mm. Uh, if If you care about the planet, then you will vote for... The Green Party. Well, actually, 
you might care about the planet and you might not think the Green Party are any good for it. So, but we've, what we do is, this is part of turning politics into religion. We're basically saying, yeah, if, if you care about people, then you'll agree with me. Mm. And if you don't, if you don't, if you don't agree with me, you're really a scumbag, you know, <laughs> because I'm a, you know, I'm a good person and I obviously care about people and you obviously don't, you know, yeah. it's, it, it's a, it's a very dangerous road to go down. It's it a very is. divisive road to go down. Yep. And this is the thing that I guess at the end of the day, division is the big thing. Isn't it? And I mean, I, I know that there were um, some of the no uh, you know, campaigners right from the very start said that this is going to create division. Um, and I mean, even that sort of, I guess, constitutionally that they were saying that, but there, it's looking like division is going to be a outcome of this no matter what. Uh, I mean, as you know, no matter which side you're on, how can we actually look to you know, start to unify the country or to stop this division from taking place uh, in amongst this debate? Well, I think, first of all, amongst Christians, we need to model good, good and respectful debate. So you don't say that someone is a you know closet Marxist because they support the voice, mm-hmm. you know, and, and you don't say that someone is a racist because they don't support the voice, you know, and and you don't even hint at these things. You don't you don't do that whatsoever. You accept that people will have different reasons. I think also there's a degree of humility that we need to have that we just don't know. I mean, I'm saying I'm I'm an outsider and I don't know. I've read loads. I've I've read. Lots of articles, books on both sides. I've read indigenous history and stuff. I still don't know. You know, I lo- there's lots of things we don't know. So we should always speak with a degree of humility. Mm. But, then, but then I think, from the Christian point of view, do you know, what matters is how we deal with our neighbor, not whether we publicly declare on social media that we care for them or... <laughs> Not whether we say we're voting for a. I mean, I knew I know people who would talk all the time about helping the poor. I'm talking about being back in Scotland, helping the poor and fighting for the poor. They never met a poor person in their life, mm. and the last thing they wanted was poor people living beside them. Yeah. You know, so it was always people away, and and I think, you know, especially in churches, there are things like there are numerous Christian churches and, and charities who are working with indigenous people and we need to look at which ones are the most effective and, and, and support and help. Mm. Um, but we absolutely must avoid this trap of thinking that either the voice is going to be the destruction of Australia or it's going to be the making of Australia. It's going to be neither. Mm. That's right. And I guess it comes back to then just picking up on what you are saying before. It's Christians walking the walk, you know, rather than just talking the talk, like actually saying, you know, how can we be supporting, you know, an indigenous person or, you know, ensuring, I mean, at the end of the day, this is all around closing the gap with the, you know, that's the, the phrase that yeah. they use, but we want to see that actually yeah. happen. You know, it's not just about um, platitudes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's not just about platitudes. Um, and, and, and again, I think as Christians, we often in, engage in platitudes. Um, you know, we, we, we're often like the people who say, uh, go, I wish you well, and we don't do anything, mm. you know. Uh, so, you know, it's really, really interesting. I, I was speaking to an indigenous brother, and I said, what do you think of all of this? And, uh, you know, this is just anecdotal, but just one person, he says, you know, when I go on marches and stuff, it's nearly all white people who want to be indigenous, <laughs> or <laughs> some of them even claiming to be indigenous, which is actually another problem here, by the way, that judging people in effect, by the color of their skin mm. or, or or by their race, which I, I find personally an abhorrent thing. And I think that is being introduced into Australia. Maybe it's always been here. Perhaps it has been. But I think to have it introduced officially is, well, I, I, I find that a very dangerous step. But it was interesting. He, 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 was, he argued with me. He didn't argue with me. He just said, I don't think it will make any difference mm. to my people, you know, and... I, I'm inclined to agree, and maybe another thing to say as Christians is when we experience um, or see any kind of racism against Indigenous people and against different races, uh, it should be something that we actually challenge. You mm. know, it's just not accept. It, it is absolutely not acceptable. Yeah, agreed. You know, yeah, good especially point. in the church, especially in the church. You know. If you see it in the church at all, uh, you know, I mean, all of us have to check 
if you like, our own privileges and our own prejudices. Um, you know, I used to joke around a lot because, you know, I'm Scottish and I used to joke about the English and stuff like that. And then I realized there was English people in my congregation and it was, you know, okay, it was banter, mm -hmm. but for some people it was a bit too real. Yeah. And I just thought, no, I got to watch this, you know. Yeah. Um, and, and I think the question of identity for the Christian, our, our identity is in Christ. And I remember an, an indigenous lady from Western Australia on a, on another radio show that I was on, she phoned up and I thought, Oh, this is going to be interesting. Cause I thought she was really going to disagree with me and she was indigenous. Who could I argue with her? And she just said, and it was absolutely lovely. She said, I agree with every word that my brother David has said, she says, I'm one of the stolen generation and the only hope for my generation. And the only hope for all of us is the cross of Christ. And I thought, yeah, that's it. Wow. That's it. Yeah, that that's was very great. beautiful. Yeah, a great sentiment and so true too. And as we've said, you know, I guess that whole message of reconciliation with God first and with our fellow man is uh, something yeah. that the church should really be uh, you know, making a big fuss about at the moment because it's a perfect opportunity to... Uh, yeah. To, to bring that up again. But uh, David, really appreciate your thoughts on this. It certainly is, uh, I guess, uh, an interesting time to say the least in, in, in our nation and uh, I guess less than a month now before uh, the vote is cast. But uh, appreciate your thoughts and your perspective today. Yeah, I appreciate being with you. And, uh, and I, I just urge your listeners to do what it says. Paul says to Timothy, pray for kings and those in authority that we may live peaceable and godly lives. And uh, may we all do that. 